Hi there, you're listening to the Really Useful Podcast. This is the tech podcast for technophobes. And now that you've done throwing shapes to our funky theme tune, uh, I will introduce myself. I'm Christian Corley from MakeUseOf.com, and with me is my MUO colleague. It's Ben Stegner. Hey, Ben, how are you doing? Doing good, Christian. It's uh, Daylight Savings here, so enjoying the bask of the sunlight as we're recording this so yeah it's weird because <laughs> whenever we talk there's always like several hours difference and it, invariably it's light at your end and dark at my end yeah so it makes no odds to me it is weird to think about that yeah it is um we probably shouldn't get distracted by that though we are here this week too um we're, we're looking at the price of video games that's basically where we are with this now i mean it's easy to get distracted by the price of video games when you're looking at the triple a and the top end and you know the brand new games that are out on the shelves or in the shelves or however you get them on, in, on your e-stores whatever and their prices but there's a bit more to it than just that so maybe we'll j- delicately tenuously look at some of the um some of the less prestigious platforms, shall we say, but mainly we're looking at the top end stuff. And I think this has kind of been kicked off, hasn't it, really, by this this idea that the price of games is going to hit a new kind of peak in the near future, isn't it, Ben? So, we, so yeah, we're told. that's true. Yeah, so the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series S and X came out in the end of the year last year, around November. Uh, and since then, we've seen some game prices go up from 60 US dollars was the norm, and now it's starting to hit $70. Um, and for some games, not all of them. So this has a lot of people not super excited, obviously, about paying mm. more for the same thing, quote unquote. It's quite, it, I mean, it is a noticeable increase, isn't it? And especially at a time when people are maybe not as well healed as they were 18 months ago. It does seem like a bad move. Um, I'm recalling a... Uh, we may have talked about this in the past on the Really Useful Podcast. Uh, games that ship in various edition levels. And and, and we're going straight to a non-prestigious um, platform now. Uh, the A gentleman called David Crane and his colleague Dan Kitchen, both from Activision back in the day, worked on the old Atari 2600. They've just formed a new company called, uh, its name escapes me right now, um, but this, this launched a new retro gaming company to produce games for the Atari 2600. Okay. And they are premium price, AAA price cartridges. So the main version the standard version is a at least 50 to 60 dollar cartridge then there's a collector edition which is 99 dollars, and that comes with extra bits and bobs like nice you know certificates and posters and things like that there's also a 150 dollar box so that, just that, for an atari 2600 for an cartridge? atari 2600 wow. cartridge you also get a digital version of the game with a matching serial number to the cartridge but you know, you can buy an album on Amazon for ten pounds and get the MP3 version of it. So that's not a particularly exciting um, development right. for that, is it? You can get the certificates of authenticity. You can you get to select a range of serial numbers. Um, so, like, if you're paying fifty dollars, you don't get to choose a serial number. If you're paying one hundred and fifty dollars, you get to pick a serial number range that's in the like the lower. They're they're optimistic. They got they think they're going to sell two thousand at least. Um, now the point is that video games physical video games at least and unfortunately this has been mirrored in digital prices inexplicably but physical video games are becoming prestige products aren't they yeah a lot of uh, like independent games that might release initially digital only because they don't have the budget to do physical it's cheaper to go digital obviously um if the game gets really popular a lot of the time they'll release a physical version because you'll have a lot of people online that say oh i want a physical copy for my collection and then they'll release a physical copy, but usually it's more expensive than the digital version, and it might include like a steel box case or an art book or something. So there's definitely a big market for it, but I think a lot of people just want to play the game and don't care either way. But I think it's definitely a, a subset of people that like to collect physical copies. Yeah, and it, it there is. Um, I should just just let you know that the the 
game company that David Crane and Dan Kitchen have launched is Audacity Games, and it's very much okay. in the um, what they've they've got a game called Circus Convoy that's out now. They've got another game coming called Casey's Gold, and they're very much in the the the, the spirit of classic Atari twenty six hundred games. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, I mean, this whole prestigeness and this collectiveness, and then this increase in prices that we're seeing. Is there a danger of putting AAA games out of the hands of gamers? And does it increase piracy? Does it increase piracy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it could. Probably more on PC, where it's easier to do that. I mean, pirating games on a console, I mean, I'm sure you can do it, but it's not quite as easy for the average person. No. Um, I think I think PC piracy will always be around. Um I haven't seen really actually too much if PC games are going up to $70. That's a good point. I know the new consoles have kind of sparked that, but I'm not sure if there's any like big Steam games that are $70 right now. I it, I, I wouldn't be surprised, to be honest with you. Um, I know that I have seen games in stores that have been 70, um, 60, 70 pound in the UK, but they have been like steel box editions. Um, so, you know. That's going to happen with those because you get an extra bit, you get like a nice solid case that looks good. You get maybe, I don't know, a, a, some kind of model with it or a belt buckle or you know all the, all those things that they they stick in there to increase the value. I don't know if this. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, I think because you're getting. I mean, it's it's that to me is for people that are big fans of the Absolutely. game because you want that extra stuff, whether it's worth it or not, up to you. But um, yeah, I just I just did a check. So one of the few games right now that went up to $70 for PS5 and Xbox Series X is NBA 2K21. So check in right now on, at GameStop at $70 um, for the PS5 version. On Steam, the, the, the PC version of 2K21 is still $60. So right. um, whether that's a PC thing or it just happened to come out before they decided to change it, we'll see. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, it's such a different environment on PC too. Like right now, this game is still seventy dollars at GameStop sticker price, so there's a sale on it right now where it's twenty bucks on PC. So sales happen more often on PC, I think, um, or big sales at least. So, yeah. well, there's all sorts of places you can. Come there. Yeah, there's all sorts of places you can go for budget PC games or you know sale price PC games. You know, the Steam has sales. They seem to have a sale every week at the moment. Uh, you've got also got things like Humble Bundle and Fanatical as well that do deals on big bundles of games for a lot less than you'd normally pay and obviously they're digital versions but you you then you get the steam key and you just add the steam key into steam and you've got like five games for five pounds or something ridiculous like that and that, maybe one of those was a triple a game 18 months ago so it's a good way of doing it but there are specific websites that you can use for video game price alerts aren't there ben yeah so i've recently written about some of the best sites for alerts so these are really handy because uh you can get alerts without having to manually check games all the time. Um, so some services like Nintendo's eShop for the Switch, if you add a game to your wish list, they'll email you when it goes on sale. But then with the recent update to the PlayStation Store, um, Sony doesn't have a wish list anymore for whatever reason. So you would have to check the games that you want to buy manually if you're waiting for the price to go down, which is a huge pain. Um, so there's a couple of different sites. Um, if you play on a console, I definitely recommend the site PS Prices. Um, pshpsprices.com um, they have a really good service for um, c connecting so, so psprices.com has a great um, way to monitor the price of console games mm -hmm. so you basically just make an account you pick what uh, platforms that you're interested in so ps4 switch wii u whatever um, and then it'll only show you games that you that you have uh, the platforms for and then you mark them as ones that you want, and then they'll email you when it goes on sale. Um, there's other sites, like for PC gamers, Is There Any Deal? It's a great site. It's super um, detailed. You can pick from like 30 different shops on like that sell Steam keys and then choose if you don't want them or if you do want to include them, and then they'll send you an email whenever there's a price. Um, and most of these sites are free. Some of them have a paid plan where you can do like more granular price alert thresholds or whatever, but um, they're a really good way if you want to save money on games that you don't have to check the games you want to buy every day. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on. 
And we'll take a moment from our usual podcast proceedings to just remind you that the Really Useful Podcast can be found pretty much anywhere you find podcasts. So we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on Google Podcasts. We're hosted at Transistor.fm, so you can find us there as well. We're also on YouTube and, of course, on MakeUseOf.com. Now, however you subscribe to the Really Useful Podcast and listen to us, it would be amazing if you could take a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That will help us to find new listeners and take our podcast to ever greater heights. You'll find the link to our Apple Podcast page in the show notes. Thanks a lot. Now, we've kind of talked about um, consoles quite a bit, but it does... Um, the, the, there are things with like PC gaming whereby the price of games might put you off what you're going to buy. It also might put you off upgrading your laptop in order to play those AAA games. Now, I um, spent some time on quite a uh, quite a decent laptop. It was an Asus uh, Rock uh, range of gaming laptops, and I know that. The, you can't really have a gaming laptop, but just like hear me out, and sure. it 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 really struggled with Call of Duty World War Two. Really, really struggled, uh, but it really didn't need to because there are various ways that you can improve gaming laptop um, gaming performance. I beg your pardon on a laptop, and um, I've compiled a list. I'm just going to go through them quickly and summarize each one. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is make sure that you keep your laptop clean and dust free to help improve gaming performance and um, air circulation inside the laptop. Second thing you need to do is upgrade your laptop hardware for improved gaming performance. Um, Laptops, you you can't upgrade much of them, but you can upgrade the RAM. You can upgrade the storage and switch into an SSD or M2 SSD will really speed things up and upgrade your battery now you're probably not going to do much gaming without being connected to the mains but having a fresh battery is always good there is one other thing in this list that i've omitted if you're a keyboard gamer keyboards can wear out some laptops are easier to replace the keyboard on than others so it's it's a good idea to look into whether if you're having responsive issues with your keyboard i've got an old uh, hb 17 inch envy upstairs huge lumbering thing and um even though it's something like four years old but the, the keyboard is uh increasingly unresponsive in various parts and replacing that's going to mean taking the laptop apart but there are some laptops where you don't need to go to that extreme so look into that if you're having responsive issues with a responsiveness issues big problem with your keyboard um you can update your laptop drivers for faster gaming there are various tools and websites you can use to help doing that and optimize your laptop for gaming by updating DirectX to the latest version at this point in time uh, early 2021 DirectX 12 ultimate is the latest version you can overclock the laptop graphics card for optimized gaming with dedicated uh, overclocking tools you can adjust your computer's power settings that can also help you can activate windows 10's game mode close background apps for increased frames per second on your laptop you can check your network speed that's always an important aspect of online gaming and you can download automatic updates for your operating system to help achieve smoother gaming you should also consider tweaking the texture settings on your laptop's graphics card and a combination of these or even all of them if you're particularly fortunate will give you better gaming performance now that list and everything else that we've talked about in this week's really useful podcast can be found in this week's show notes i um i mean i haven't used a desktop computer in some years now i've used a combination of windows tablets um and latterly uh windows and Linux laptops and I mean I don't really miss the desktop computers and there is the advantage of having two or three games consoles knocking around and to be honest I am finding that lap gaming on a laptop isn't isn't really that bad it I mean years ago I mean it's probably improved for, for in hardware terms 
with with better technology and everything but you know a few years ago even like four or five years ago a lot, the idea of gaming on a laptop was either ridiculous or way out of budget because hardly anyone could afford a four-day uh, alienware laptop unless they were a hardcore gamer but it's more affordable my current laptop is a um md ryzen 4000 series with rx graphics and it cost me under a thousand pounds so and it's um it's playing some nice things a good quality speed. yeah that's nice that it's more more accessible i i i the laptop i had in college didn't have dedicated graphics but i it had a pretty powerful cpu and it had for the time a decent amount of ram so i was able to play like fallout 3 um and a couple of games on there that were older and i was surprised but yeah, a couple of years ago, a buddy of mine got a pretty nice gaming laptop that, you know, pretty beefy, has a dedicated card and everything. And uh, I was surprised at how high the specs were for it being a laptop. Yeah. Um, I've really never played, aside from a little bit in college, like I said, I haven't really played like any serious games on a laptop like that. But for general use, I do a lot. I love my desktop. I have to say I built it just about four years ago and having my multiple monitors and everything is that's definitely my preferred way to work. I'm not a huge laptop person. I use them when I have to, but, um, yeah, I guess it's nice to be able to switch between both though. Huh? Yeah, definitely. And well, here's an interesting thing. Um, I have Star Wars Battlefront two on Xbox one and I've got it on PC and the graphics are better on the PC than they are on the Xbox one. Now on your laptop, yeah. Now there is a caveat to that. There's a chance that the display on my laptop is better than the TV. But even oh, so, okay. I was, I'm, and I'm obviously I sit slightly closer to the laptop than I do to the TV, only slightly. And um, but I was blown away at the um, the the just just the edges and the the the, the light and and the quality of the graphics on the on the Windows version. Um, as I say, th that might be a difference in the displays, but it, it was the fact that it plays it in the, more or less the exactly same way. And also, you know, I'm kind of, in terms of first person games at least, and may maybe beyond, but I played, so I played Battlefront 2 on an Xbox with an Xbox controller, and I've played it on the laptop with a keyboard and mouse, and I absolutely walked it with the keyboard and mouse now i haven't played it on and i'm talking about the item version of story mode here and i haven't played that in about a year on the xbox i played it on my laptop uh, loaded it about a month ago and i got through it in i don't play it very often because you know there's a lot going on that make use of and i've got children and there's other things going on so when i get to dedicate sure. a bit of time to gaming i maybe get like two or three hours a week i got through it in two weeks and i think that's pretty i think it's not the quickest way of getting through it but the fact of the matter is the first time i played it it took me a, at least a month and i just got through it and the, the keyboard and mouse is just so much easier to to do on shooters than a game than a console a, a game controller console controller yeah i know it is objectively superior i need to just force myself to play uh, pc game through with keyboard and mouse like that yeah i know yeah. eventually i'll get better at it but it's I think part of the problem is that really the own the only game I play on PC with any kind of regularity is Overwatch because I have friends that play it on PC, so it's not the main place I play the game. But because playing with a controller, I've been playing that game for years, and playing it with a controller is just how my mind works. Um, like I won't play as well in the game if I switch my control scheme because I have to think about the controls instead of it just being all muscle memory, you know? So, yeah. I need to take a different game, probably a single player game where I'm not worried about the comp uh, the competition of multiplayer and just play through it like that. But yeah, I know a lot of people that say that, like if they ever, if they're used to playing shooters on PC and they switch to a controller for a game, it's like, they feel like they have one hand tied behind their back. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, well, I've gone, the, I've kind of gone to console and then I've kind of come back to PC because usually on PC I'm playing strategy games. But uh, yeah, that was, um, it's interesting to find out that I went, fell straight back into it. Um, I've also been playing the, um, I haven't really, I haven't been playing it, but I have also been playing the um, GoldenEye 007 leak. And that's as much I'm going to say about that. Um, oh. You mentioned muscle memory. I've completely forgotten my Xbox login. The only, my fingers know what it is. My head has no idea what it is. 
That's a really weird phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. But we talked about controllers in a previous uh, really useful podcast, and I think this is kind of one of the galling things about upping the price of games is that the controllers are also expensive. So, and it's not all that's expensive about gaming, is it? So it's it it does feel somewhat uncomfortable that if games are going to get more expensive than the hardware, you know, you just l paid a lot of money for a brand new console. The game's getting more expensive. If a controller gets broken, then you know that's basically the price of a game to replace the controller. It's not getting any cheaper, yeah, is it? Yeah, it, it is. It's kind of a pain with that. I I know like when a console gets a little bit later into its life and you start seeing the bundles that include like two games or a controller or whatever. Like I, I've told people like go for the bundle with the controller because yeah. the controller doesn't lose its value as quickly. Like, yeah, it might drop in price a little bit, but you know, a game that's worth $50 today is going to be worth $15 in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Whereas that controller will serve you well. I mean, they're not quite as vital as they used to be to have extra controllers because local multiplayer is so um diminished in priority you know in games now but it's still nice to have an extra one to swap if your battery dies or just yeah, yeah. if one goes bad or whatever but yeah they are expensive okay so in terms of game pricing i i guess the price of games really wh whatever it is i suppose in terms of new games you're very rarely going to go out and buy two or three new games at once anyway so maybe that top pricing maybe that's does that work to the benefit of the buyer in that it focuses them into making the choice and making that game buying that game that they really want rather than just kind of wavering does it does it do that do you think uh, it might i think it depends on different kinds of players um so i think a lot of these like sports games that are going to go up to 70 dollars a pop um these are games like fifa or like nba 2k that come out every year and I think a lot of people that play these games, that's kind of what they focus on playing. So they might just play FIFA or they just play 2K or maybe they play just all sports games. So I think that for that kind of person, you know, if they only buy one or two games a year, you know, an extra 10 bucks for a game they play all the time probably isn't a huge deal. Yeah. Um, I think you have some people that like to get new games right away, you know, so a new Call of Duty comes out, they want to get that, a new Resident Evil comes out, they want to get that right away, a new Nintendo game comes out. Um, I think that's the people it's going to hurt the most, obviously. Um, but I mean, a lot of games go cheaper before long. I mean, I bought Crash 4 when it came out, and it was full price because I love Crash, and that's that game's a whole different story, but I mean, you can get the game for, I think, $30 now, and it's only been out since October, so if you wait a couple months, your patience is definitely rewarded. Um, yeah, so I guess it could help you kind of focus on only playing the games you really want to play because you know if you get it right away, you're paying the absolute highest price for it. Especially when a lot of games, you know, later on, like I bought Horizon Zero Dawn's complete edition for 20 bucks, I think, and it came with the DLC, which was pretty sizable. So you're getting more game for less money when you wait, but that's, you know, you have to wait years for that, of course. Yeah. I do think that maybe... Well, no, I know. Obviously, gaming is getting more expensive. And in, in this kind of scenario where we're in now, where we're, you've, you've got lockdowns, you've got cinema closures, and you've got this increasing... Um, you've, got, you've got this issue with movies, basically having nowhere to go other than streaming services. And you're not paying the same price as you would at the cinema because, you know, at the cinema, you're probably paying... I, I don't know what it is in the US. In the UK, it's probably about... 15 pounds a ticket then you've got your popcorn and your hot dog and your ice cream and you're spending maybe just for two people maybe 50 quid uh and a, a family trip to the cinema can be you know potentially sure hundred. yeah real expensive yeah so maybe i mean I'm, I'm thinking of things like the the new snyder cut that's going to be 20 25 quid that's cheaper than a video game you're probably going to be able to watch it once at this stage but I I do wonder whether or not with with you know with streaming services and game streaming services as well are new games putting themselves beyond I think are they putting themselves pricing themselves out the market when you have streaming services like Nvidia Go for PC when you've got um, the Xbox streaming service 
on Xbox where you you know you're paying for your Game Pass and you can play any of those games. Pretty pretty likely your AAA game is going to end up in there within six months, if not sooner. Sure. Are they, are they are they playing the right game here by putting the prices up? The game publishers. Yeah, I th- that's a hard question. So there's a couple of things I was going to say about this that are kind of related to what you just said. So one of my there's two two main things. One is that um, obviously game production costs have gone up. You know, it costs more to make a giant RPG that lasts for a hundred hours with HD sure. graphics than it did to make a game on the Super Nintendo. Um, but a lot of the money that's spent when they talk about, you know, this game cost X million dollars to make a lot of the time for the most expensive games, a lot of that money is spent on marketing. Um, and obvious, I mean, I'm not saying that obviously a ton of money spent on the game itself, but if you take out marketing costs, a lot of those huge numbers drop quite a bit. So, you know, to say that a game cost a hundred million dollars to make because the company spent $30 million on TV commercials and everything else. I mean, that's, they spent that money to promote the game, obviously, but it didn't cost that money to make. So that kind of can inflate the numbers that they say are games are costing. Um, and the other part, and this is the part that I have the biggest problem with, is that games are more profitable than ever today. So when people talk about, you know, games used to cost however much back in the 90s and adjusted for inflation, that's blah, blah, blah. That I, That makes sense. But that doesn't take into account that today game developers have and publishers have so many more ways to make money. So, you know, Nintendo sold a copy of super Mario world. Um, well, I was included. So that's a bad example, but they sold a copy of Ocarina of time. You know, that was it. They sold the game. That's that there's, there's nothing more they can make from it. Whereas today, pretty much every game that's sold has some kind of DLC or microtransactions or whatever. And it's not just like one map pack that you buy and that's it. It's, currency and loot boxes and battle passes that are ongoing and there are big streams of revenue um you know so a game like overwatch that i've played for years you know i paid however much i paid for it four years ago but it still makes money for blizzard because you can buy loot boxes um and it's still profitable for them or a game like rocket league goes free to play and still makes a ton of money because you can pay for more cosmetics and things like that Mm -hmm. so um i i it's i think a lot of games could be free and they would still make buku bucks because people would pay for the cosmetics and everything in them. Um, not every game, obviously, you know, a, sh- a short little indie game or that, that they don't have any microtransactions. That's not going to be profitable if they give it away for free. But that's the biggest problem I have is 10 more dollars up front really going to offset the people that spend hundreds of dollars on in-game purchases. I don't think so. No, I don't either. It's a funny thing you mentioned that actually, because I have recently rediscovered Civilization Five and found that I love it. Absolutely love it far more than Civ Six which is kind of geared to this whole seasons mode um, dynamic of games where I I don't really understand, to be honest with you. They just keep releasing content and releasing DLC that you pay for and some that you don't pay for. And it's not... Why why do they call it seasons? It's not a TV show. Why are you doing... Why why are you just redefining reality around me? It's not a TV show. Why are you calling it seasons? They're just updates, surely. Yeah, I think the I, I'm I feel like I haven't been playing as much multiplayer since the battle pass took off, which is what you're referring to. So the season, the I think the idea because like Call of Duty's been doing this and Rocket League has a battle pass now. Fortnite I think was one of the first ones to do it, kind of infamously. I think the I think the point with the season pass or not the season pass, the battle pass in these seasons is that. It, it makes you want to keep playing no, because when you look at the battle pass, you know, there's a hundred levels, right? Yeah. So when you get to level two, you unlock this when you get to level three and so on. Um, but then if you buy the premium pass, you unlock more stuff. So some games you get a little bit for free. Some games you don't get anything unless you pay. So I think the idea is, you know, you play normally and you get to level 25 or whatever. And you think, Oh, if I just paid 20 bucks, I would unlock all this stuff. And I already pay. And then if you pay for it, you think, well, I paid for it and the season ends in three weeks. So I better play some more to get my value out of it. Um, that's where the psychology seems to come into it for me, I think. So, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, loot boxes were annoying when they were the trend because it's just paying for a chance at something instead of at least paying for an item that you want. Yeah. I feel like the battle pass is good in some ways, but then it also has that psychology of like, well, I have to keep playing this game because I paid for the battle pass that ends in a week or whatever. I guess then we should probably wrap this up. Video games are getting more expensive 
and we've been discussing why and how you can basically be put yourself in a good position to find games at the best value by um, using particular websites that will let you know when the games that you want to buy are at the price that you want to pay so i mean we kind of know the games are going to go up in price because these are ea games that are the main announcement of this aren't they and everyone else is likely to follow because they're kind of like one of the biggest if not the biggest name in game publishing sure 2k and yeah and call it the new call of duty was the same way yeah. activision so so the, the, I, I guess the big question is is this good or bad for me when anything gets more expensive then it's got it's got to be a bad thing especially when you've paid a load of money for a console and given how difficult these some of these consoles are to get hold of as well it's it all makes it that is intentional isn't it obviously there have been um supply issues but this has happened with previous console generation releases where there hasn't been enough to satisfy demand in quotes and right you know we can blame covid restrictions if we like but maybe not so much microsoft but certainly we're always going to have limits on the number of consoles that they put out at this stage weren't they in order to generate interest yeah i think it especially for them where the the draw is the new system. I mean, obviously it's the same with Microsoft, but I think right now, we talked about this before, I believe that Microsoft's yeah. kind of winning proposition is Game Pass, yeah. which is available on Xbox One. So it's if you're an Xbox person, I don't think it's quite, a, like you don't, you're getting a lot of value with Game Pass on your current console. So I don't think it has quite the draw with the Series X that the PS5 has as the must have new thing. I mean, they're both cool to have obviously, but yeah, I would say you're probably right about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you spent years and years developing a piece of tech and you know what the supply chain is for it, you're going to make sure that you've got enough of them to go live and not, you know, for launch and not do what happened last time, which is run out of them and, oh, hold on, it's happened again. Oh, look, everyone's interested in my new console. Oh, let's keep this going a little yeah. bit longer. Mm. Yeah. Um, so gaming, it's expensive, isn't it? That's basically the takeaway. It is. And uh, we need to uh, do what we can to uh, mitigate that, whether it means not upgrading your tech at that particular point, uh, optimizing your hardware as much as possible, and being very selective when you buy games. My other general tip, I, I think that was a great summary. My other general like silver lining and all this that we talked about is I hope that rising prices for big AAA games like this push more people to check out some indie games too. There are so many great independent games on every platform that are they're mostly free of all this nonsense we're talking about with loot boxes and everything. They're just really great experiences and all kinds of genres. Um, and they don't cost as much all the time. I mean, there's indie games that cost 15 or $20 that are very rich experiences with tons to do and a lot of charm. So if you're dismayed by the super expensive big time games, wait on those and go check out the best indie games for the systems that you have. Cause I'm sure there's something you'll find that you like that you weren't expecting. Yeah, definitely. And also consider dipping your toe into retro gaming because they're not yeah, all, they're good. not all $50 cartridges. There's um, an excellent system called the Evercade, which uh, has curated collections of real licensed games from days of your, and it's a nice handheld unit. It's worth checking out. So that brings us to the end of this week's really useful podcast from MakeUseOf.com. I'm Christian Corley. He's Ben Stegner. I will be back next time with another really useful podcast. Until then, it's goodbye from us.